In the world of pro wrestling, heroes and villains are all part of the show. The battle between good and evil is a central part of the storytelling, but sometimes the story goes beyond the ring. Backstage politics and personal conflicts have often become more interesting than the action we see on TV. In today's video, we're taking a look at the top 10 people in wrestling who, at one point or another, were utterly despised. Today, Triple H is highly respected as WWE's chief content officer and is apparently an all-round nice guy to deal with. But rewinding the clock 25 years, it's easy to forget just how much both the fans and his peers in the locker room hated his guts. Triple H's early days in the WWF saw him languishing in the mid-card but his career trajectory changed dramatically when he became associated with The Click, a backstage group that was hated by the other wrestlers in the locker room. In fact, The Click ruined the careers of other wrestlers and used their influence to get ahead themselves, and Triple H certainly benefited by being part of the gang. Eventually, the clique disbanded and their stranglehold on the WWF came to an end. However, in 2002, Triple H was up to his old tricks once again. Now he was married to Stephanie McMahon and had become the most powerful active wrestler on the roster. This era was marked by the introduction of a new World Heavyweight title on the Raw brand. This new title was simply handed to Triple H by general manager Eric Bischoff. It was a move that many saw as a blatant display of favouritism. As the new World Heavyweight Champion, Triple H steamrolled through a generation of wrestlers who many believed were the future of the business. Fans also hated the long, droning promos that he used to cut on every episode of Raw, and they hated his plodding, 25-minute-long pay-per-view matches even more. To the WWF fans of the 80s and early 90s, Hulk Hogan was like a real-life superhero, and he became the first WWF superstar to transition into the mainstream, where he became a household name. But you don't stay at the top of a business like wrestling, without a bit of political manoeuvring. Hogan's contracts often included a creative control clause which allowed him to veto and change storylines in order to protect his image and that was a power that he had absolutely no problem using over the years. In WCW, Hogan continued to leverage his creative control where he influenced major events and storylines to his own advantage. More recently, fans have struggled to tell whether Hogan is losing his mind or is just a compulsive liar. He's told blatant lies about almost becoming the lead bass player for Metallica, about being Elvis's favourite wrestler and even about almost becoming a cage fighter back in the day. But more seriously, a secret recording of Hogan using racist language was leaked to the public in 2015. The situation led to WWE removing Hogan from the Hall of Fame and ending his Legends deal. Eventually, he apologised and WWE let him back in again, as if nothing had ever happened. JBL's in-ring career spanned from the new generation where he was known as Justin Hawk Bradshaw through to the Attitude Era as part of the APA and then on to the Ruthless Aggression Era where he reinvented himself as the despised WWE Champion of SmackDown. With all of that experience, you might expect a man like JBL to be a mentor in the locker room to the young up-and-coming superstars. But sadly not. JBL's tenure in WWE was marred by allegations of backstage bullying, unprovoked attacks and a general disregard for the well-being of his fellow wrestlers. Take his attack on the Blue Meanie, for example. JBL targeted the Blue Meanie for real, delivering a series of stiff, legitimate punches to his face. 
This brutal assault wasn't part of the show. It was a real and unscripted attack that left the Blue Meanie bloodied and injured. René Dupree debuted in WWE at the age of 19. In various interviews, Dupree has described how JBL bullied him mercilessly backstage. According to Dupree, JBL would frequently call him a f whenever he walked into the locker room. Even more disturbing are the reports of JBL harassing non-wrestlers. He allegedly dumped a bucket of ice water over ring announcer Lillian Garcia's head while she was sleeping. In his book, Best Seat in the House, Justin Roberts says JBL would routinely tell him to go himself and called him dipshit and numbnuts. But not everyone took JBL's actions lying down. Commentator Joey Styles, for example, fought back against the bullying. On a 2008 tour of Iraq, after enduring a week of harassment, Styles reportedly had enough of JBL. In a moment of defiance that has since gone down in legend, Styles punched JBL in the face, allegedly giving him a black eye. During the 90s, Eric Bischoff turned WCW into the number one wrestling promotion in America and almost managed to put the WWF out of business. And it's no exaggeration to say that Bischoff pissed off a lot of people to get there. When he became the boss of WCW, he immediately made controversial changes to the company and that rubbed people up the wrong way. Iconic commentator Jim Ross was removed from television and relegated to an ad sales position, which is something that he absolutely hated doing. WCW legend Ric Flair had a rocky relationship with Bischoff that was marked by legal disputes, public disrespect and personal animosity. Steve Austin was let go over the phone by Bischoff while he was injured, a move that Austin took as a deep personal insult and was eventually the catalyst for his Stone Cold character in the WWF. Safe to say, Bischoff didn't care about Austin because Hulk Hogan was just about to arrive in WCW. Bischoff loved having a legitimate megastar like Hogan under contract and not only did he pay Hogan a fortune, he also gave him a contract with massive creative control. This favouritism created a difficult atmosphere backstage and it fostered resentment amongst wrestlers who often felt overlooked and underutilised. And then there were the dirty tactics that Bischoff used during the Monday Night War. He would reveal the WWF results during live Nitro broadcasts, and he pulled stunts like having Alundra Blaze trash the WWF Women's Championship live on Nitro. All of this and more parlayed into Bischoff being utterly detested back in the 1990s. Today, Shawn Michaels is a true wrestling legend, celebrated for being one of the best wrestlers ever. His return to WWE in 2002 showed a changed man who had beaten his personal demons and found religion. However, the Shawn Michaels of the 1990s was a very different person as he raised absolute hell backstage. His rise to stardom began as one half of the Rockers alongside Marty Jannetty and the charismatic duo quickly became fan favourites. But the men soon gained a reputation in the locker room as heavy drinkers and drug takers and troublemakers. Later on in his career, he formed the Click. Their constant politicking made the men hated backstage, but it was clear that Michaels was the ringleader of the group. As he became more famous, his drug abuse issues grew too, along with the size of his ego. He and his buddies in the clique bullied and trampled on the other wrestlers in the locker room, their treatment of Chris Candido being a notable example of their awful behaviour. Michaels infamously began an affair with Sonny, who was Candido's real-life girlfriend. 
Candido's mental health suffered really badly thanks to this situation. Other WWF careers that he ruined included that of Shane Douglas, Bam Bam Bigelow, Vader, the list goes on and on. Despite all of this, Michaels was Vince McMahon's favourite child, and so he turned a blind eye to his drug-taking and horrible behaviour, allowing him to get away with near murder backstage. Roman Reigns might be hated now as the tribal chief and longest reigning universal champion, but he also spent years being hated for all the wrong reasons by the fans. After WWE split the shield up, a years-long campaign began where they forced Roman Reigns down the fans' throats. He was immediately positioned to be the company's next top babyface, but the push felt rushed and artificial. His 2015 Royal Rumble win was met with total disdain from the fans who had already rejected him. They wanted Daniel Bryan to be their champion, but Vince McMahon didn't listen to the fans. McMahon believed that if he pushed Reigns hard and long enough, then they would eventually accept him. And so, we ended up with literally years of Reigns being forced into the top spot in WWE. And the more McMahon tried, the lamer Roman came across. They gave him blue contact lenses to make him look more heroic, and they scripted him awful promos, which included lines like this. You are a sniveling little suck-up sellout full of suffering suck tash son! It took years before Vince McMahon finally relented. In August 2020, he turned Roman Reigns heel and we got the version of him that we always wanted. Roman played the heel tribal chief down to a T. It was a natural fit for him. But now, let's fast forward to the present day. Reigns has hogged the Universal title for nearly three and a half years, so it's safe to say, in 2024, we're all sick of Roman Reigns once again. Despite WWE presenting her as a comedy character alongside Mae Young, and more recently as a legend of women's wrestling, it turns out that the fabulous Moolah was an absolute witch. Behind the scenes, Moolah's career is tainted with allegations of exploitation, manipulation and underhanded tactics. While she was a trainer, many of her students accused her of taking advantage of them by controlling their careers for her own profit and even sexually exploiting them. Over time, numerous female wrestlers have spoken out, alleging that Moolah acted as a pimp reportedly offering up young female wrestlers to promoters who then used them sexually. Throughout the 1980s, Moolah exerted control over women's wrestling in the WWF, deciding who got to be on TV and how much they got paid. At a time when the Federation was experiencing an explosion of popularity, she held women's wrestling back decades. Vince Russo was a key writer during the WWF's Attitude Era, a time that revitalised the company with edgier content. In the WWF, Russo was the man behind many of the more controversial storylines, but Vince McMahon always had the final say. Russo ended up quitting the WWF when he fell out with McMahon over pay and working conditions. By 1999, Ted Turner's once mighty wrestling division was struggling. WCW was losing to the WWF in the ratings and the show was a total mess. And so, they hired Vince Russo, hoping that he'd bring some of the magic that had turned the WWF's fortunes around. But without Vince McMahon's guidance, Russo's version of WCW was absolutely atrocious. If anything, he accelerated the company's decline rather than helping to save it. He gave talented wrestlers like Mike Awesome terrible, embarrassing gimmicks and put them in nonsensical, crap storylines that often went nowhere. And he even ruined the Cruiserweight division, one of WCW's best ever features from back in the day. 
But the Cruiserweight title wasn't the only championship that Vince Russo besmirched. In a decision that would cement him as being one of the most hated people in wrestling history, he made B-list actor David Arquette the World Heavyweight Champion. And so, in the end, fans turned away from WCW even faster than before Russo got involved, and by 2001, it went out of business. For John Cena, the road to acceptance from WWE fans was very long indeed. He debuted in 2002 and failed to connect with the audience at all, but by 2003, he started getting over in his role as the Doctor of Thugonomics. But then they started pushing him even harder. And after he won the WWE title for the first time, fans started to turn against him. He introduced this crap spinner belt for a start. Cena then went on a years-long run where he was basically unbeatable and his matches were tiresome and predictable and the fans would boo him louder than any of the heels on the roster at the time. It took until around 2015 for fans to start giving him a hero's welcome. Vince McMahon is the godfather of professional wrestling. He turned WWE into a global entertainment juggernaut, bringing pro wrestling into mainstream culture. But Vinnie Mac is a complicated man, and while we have a lot to thank him for, he's also caused a lot of controversy. From the moment he took control of the business in 1984, McMahon held an iron grip on WWE. For better or worse, he micromanaged every aspect of the company for decades. While McMahon turned certain wrestlers into multi-millionaires, there were also hundreds, if not thousands of others, who he treated badly. Here was a man who fired wrestlers en masse depending on his mood. He became known for pushing promising young wrestlers for months on TV and then suddenly losing interest and ditching them. For a long time, people in the industry used to call McMahon a genius. You could argue that he was a genius all the way up to the end of the Attitude Era in the early 2000s. But that's when things started to go wrong. These days, nobody seems to call Vince McMahon a genius anymore. Reports began to emerge of McMahon ripping up running orders and forcing the writers to start again an hour before the show every Monday. He started cancelling storylines halfway through, and some of the storylines that did get through just made no sense. Behind the scenes, there were reports of McMahon causing a toxic working environment. Wrestlers and staff often found themselves at the mercy of his mood swings, with some former staff members reporting that it was like walking on eggshells around him backstage. As I've already touched on in our segments looking at John Cena and Roman Reigns, McMahon became notorious for disregarding fan feedback. He was no longer interested in providing the fans with what they wanted. It was Vince's way, or the highway. That way of thinking eroded WWE's fan base in the 2000s, with millions of wrestling fans turning off and never coming back. There have been sexual assault allegations levelled against McMahon as early as 1992 and more recently in 2020. Due to issues around those 2020 allegations, McMahon finally took a back seat when it comes to the day-to-day -day running of WWE, and both the fans and the employees of the company have been far happier ever since he left. <laughs> 